Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We really appreciate your support for this series and these readers. I'm Susan Stinson, and I'm writer in residence at, here at Forbes. And this is the last um, event in this season of the Local History Local Novelists um, series. It runs from October to May, and this is our third year. And we will be back next year. Um, I'm kind of happy to say that the first event in October in um, the next season is going to be the book launch for my novel about Jonathan Edwards' Spider in a Tree. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so, um, but next month we do have a reading on the first Wednesday of the month. Our, our programs always run on the first Wednesday of the month. Um, except in April. But um, in, so June 5th at 7 p.m., we're going to have a really lovely event, which is a, a reading um, from some of the writers who use the writing room here at Forbes. On Wednesdays and Saturdays, we um, meet in the Watson room on the mezzanine. Um, so and mostly we just write together. We do a little reading together. So we're going to share, 13 readers who use the writing room are going to share um, brief readings, just like we do with each other. It's going to be kind of wonderful. And there's flyers about that event um, on the refreshments table in the gallery if you didn't get one. Um, and you're interested, pick one up. Um, OK, this is a trick question, but has anybody here come to every single reading in this series? Yes. <laughs> I think you're the only one. That's why I recognized you. Yay! <laughs> so that is fantastic. We appreciate that. Um, and I also want to thank Lisa Downing um, and Julie Bartlett Nelson, who's not here, and also Bonnie Burnham, who couldn't come tonight, but all these folks, and Lisa deeply and especially um, work very hard to bring all sorts of programs to um, to us at the library, especially this one, and they wouldn't happen without them, and they're sort of behind the scenes, but they do really wonderful work. Yay. <laughs> so, tonight is a celebration of local novelists, and we have four wonderful novelists with us tonight. M.P. Barker, Karen V. Williams, Marianne Banks, and Suzanne strimpik Shea. M.P. Barker says that writing A Difficult Boy and her forthcoming novel, Mending Horses, allowed her to combine childhood dreams of becoming a novelist and owning a horse with her grown-up jobs as an archivist and a historian. In the 1990s, Michelle did a stint as a costume historical interpreter at Old Sturbridge Village, where she got to time travel on a daily basis to 1830s New England. She says you can do all the research you want, but there's nothing like sitting with your face against a muddy cow's belly and getting slapped upside the head with a manure-soaked tail to give your story that been there, done that feeling. <laughs> and to add a new pungent dimension to the words in your face. <laughs> After Sturbridge, Michelle became an archivist at the Connecticut Valley Historical Museum. She's the author of two nonfiction books, 140 Years of Providential Caring, a History of the Sisters of Providence, co-authored with Tom Shea and Suzanne Strimpik Shea, who's here tonight, and Images of America, Chicopee, a pictorial history of Chicopee, Massachusetts. Besides being a writer, she's also a freelance historical consultant and a circuit writer for Preservation Massachusetts. Her other projects have included ex exhibits, nominations to the National Register of Historic Places, planning studies, and local history publications. We're so happy to have Michelle here tonight. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really, really thrilled to be here, and thrilled also to be in the company of Suzanne and Marianne and Karen. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from my novel, A Difficult Boy, which is set in Western Massachusetts. It's about two boys who are indentured servants. The younger boy, Ethan, is nine years old, and he's a Yankee kid. And the older boy, Daniel, is 16, and he's Irish. So at first, these boys think they're going to be each other's enemy, and they butt heads pretty quickly. But then they very quickly learn that it's their boss who's the real enemy, and they have to get over their differences if they want to survive the situation they're in. So what brings them together is their love for a horse, Ivy, that they're both assigned to take care of. And in the scene I'm going to read, 
Ethan and Daniel have just taken Ivy to the blacksmiths to get new shoes, and they've run across this weird little peddler who has this ugly, ugly horse. And this peddler challenges them to a race. So this is what happens. Um, and, and just to start out, um, Daniel, because the peddler is so um, large and the horse is so ugly, decides to give them a three-second head start. <laughs> Go, Ethan shouted. Fizzy lurched forward, showering Ethan and Daniel with clods of earth. Ivy skipped and strained impatiently as Daniel held her in place. The agreed-upon three seconds seemed more like 30 as Fizzy's dappled rump bobbed farther and farther away. Then Daniel's weight shifted. He let out a sharp cry, and Ivy leaped into the race. Ethan felt like a dry leaf spun into a cyclone. Any second, he and Daniel and Ivy might whirl apart and be flung to pieces. At first, he could sense nothing but Ivy's coarse mane slapping at his face and his own urgent clinging with hands, arms, legs, soul. His only thought was, don't fall off, don't fall off. Sounds broke through the blur, drumming beneath them as Ivy's hooves met and left the earth so fast that Ethan couldn't separate one footfall from the next. Ivy's greedy inhaling and moist exhaling, Daniel's steady stream of Gaelic-laden magic words. Then Ethan was aware of another set of drum beats and breaths, another set of words. Fizzy galloped ahead of them, his legs flying any old how in such a bizarre galumphing run that Ethan wondered if the gelding's knees and hocks were in their proper places, or if perhaps he had a few more than his proper share. The shaggy tufts of hair at Fizzy's fetlocks fluttered like birds flapping around his heels. It was a ridiculous gait, and yet Daniel's body crushed Ethan lower against the mare, and he uttered a word that Ethan was sure was a curse. Sweet Jesus, I can't catch the bloody beast. They crested the hill and turned along the high side of the meadow. Chestnut hair whipped Ethan's eyes. He blinked, and the horse in front loomed larger. The chanting over Ethan's head turned roughly musical. Fizzy's hoofbeats pounded out a deeper, louder rumble. His rider's voice changed from a vague hint of words into something Ethan recognized as song. The peddler hadn't lied about being a singing master. His sturdy baritone barely shuddered, even with the jostling of Fizzy's hooves. Ethan almost laughed when he identified the song as Happy Land, Ma's favorite hymn. Mr. Stocking was just reaching the part where sickness and sorrow, pain and death are felt and feared no more. Only he changed the words to lameness and founder and moldy hay are felt and feared no more. Canaan's fair and happy land apparently had room in it for horses, at least in the peddler's world. As Ivy gained on Fizzy, Mr. Stocking's singing increased in volume and tempo. He changed to a fuguing tune, and Ethan was certain the peddler sang all four parts. Fly swifter round, old horse of mine, and earn the welcome hay. They crossed the upper meadow that way, Ivy's nose close enough for Fizzy's tail to tickle her, but never getting any closer. Daniel's spell intensified. His words danced around each other and blended into one great continuous word. He squeezed himself together like a tightening spring, pressing Ethan nearly flat into Ivy's mane. Ethan turned his head, and suddenly he was looking Mr. Stocking in the eye. The peddler sang tenor now. Oh, may my horse in tune be found, even though he's big and round. Peddler and horse both shone with sweat. Mr. Stocking's spectacles flashed, and then there was nothing but swirls of green and brown in front of Ethan's face. His ears vibrated with Daniel's whoop ringing over his head. Ethan would have laughed, too, if he'd been able to breathe. They pounded for the downhill slope that would lead them back to the start. The crush against Ethan's back eased, and he sucked in a long, laughing breath. Mr. Stocking's singing fell far away from them. Ivy's gallop felt like a stone skipping across the surface of a pond, skimming over the meadow, then touching with a splash of torn dirt and grass, then skimming again. Ethan's excitement was tempered by the breathless fear that the whole adventurer would end in a disastrous plunge. His hands throbbed from his grip on Ivy's mane, fingernails digging hard into palms. His back and shoulders groaned with the tension of his crouch. He had long ago lost the feeling in his legs. He'd never been so afraid or so sore in his life. The ride would surely kill him. He wished it would never end. Then, in the heartbeat between one stride and another, Ethan sensed something different about the mare's pace, the tone of Daniel's voice, Daniel's posture. There was a drumming just behind Ethan's left shoulder, a wheezing breath along Ivy's flank. The gray muzzle, nostrils flared and red-lined, crept up by Daniel's calf, then Ethan's, then by Ivy's withers. The layer of sweat on Fizzy's hide had turned his pale gray coat to white-flecked iron. His head bobbed raggedly, as if his neck had tired of holding it. Mr. Stocking's fun and frivolity had disappeared behind a mask of sweat. 
His mouth hung open, but there were no more songs coming from his lips. Then the moment passed, and Ethan found himself looking at the back of Mr. Stocking's head. No! His hands jerked at Ivy's mane. Come on, Ivy, you can beat him. You can do it. He felt a brief surge of gratification as Ivy's ears flicked, and she drew closer again. Then he grunted with the thud of an elbow in his side. Quiet, you, Daniel hissed over his head. I'm the one riding this horse. But Ivy dropped farther back on the downhill slope, her muzzle against Fizzy's rump. Frustration clawed at Ethan's belly. Couldn't Daniel see that Fizzy was tiring? Surely Ivy had enough left in her to surge ahead. But the starting point flew past with Ivy still at the gelding's flank. She passed Fizzy only after the peddler had reined the huffing gelding to a stop. Ivy trickled to a canter, then a trot, then a walk, before Daniel stopped her well past her rival. Fists balled, Ethan twisted to look up at Daniel. How could you lose? Ivy should have beat him. She should have. He wanted to pound Daniel's chest with his fists and curse him for his incompetent riding. His face passive, Daniel slid to the ground. Hush, you don't know nothing about horses, lad. He reached up to help Ethan down. Ethan snubbed the offer, even though his legs felt limp. He clutched Ivy's shoulder to keep from collapsing. Eyes stinging, he opened his mouth to fire a stream of accusations at Daniel. Daniel cut him off with a cool look. Fix your hat. We'll be walking her out a bit now. <clears throat> Ethan snatched the straw hat from his head and wrestled with the dents. We could have won, he muttered. He tried to stalk away, but his legs wobbled, nearly dropping him onto his knees. Daniel took his arm and forced him to walk alongside the mare, away from Mr. Stocking and Fizzy. Ivy's withers gleamed damply, but she held her head neatly poised, flared nostrils questing for a treat from Daniel's pockets, as if she had forgotten her recent humiliation. Could it have been her fault? Ethan wondered. Was she one of those horses who were all show and no go? No, Ethan was sure Ivy would have run herself to death for Daniel, but he had just stopped trying. They walked the mare for a long time before Daniel turned back toward the peddler and his gelding. Ethan's stomach clenched at the sight of Fizzy, standing wilted and straddle-legged. His nose nearly touched the ground, ears flopping like dead leaves, sides heaving in and out. Mr. Stocking's hands moved over the horse, massaging legs, inspecting feet. He pulled a rag from his pocket and wiped Fizzy's sweaty hide in soothing swirls and sweeps, working his way toward the horse's drooping head. His arms circled Fizzy's muzzle and propped the horse's nose against his belly so that Mr. Stocking could look into Fizzy's eyes. Murmuring soothing endearments, the little man stroked Fizzy's cheek. It was only when the boys drew right alongside that Ethan realized Mr. Stocking's hands were trembling. Sir? Daniel held Ivy's lead rope out to Mr. Stocking. Mr. Stocking stared blankly at the red-headed boy. The little man's face now had a grayish tinge to it. His shirt clung damply to his thick body, and his hair lay flat and wet against his scalp. A dullness had replaced the playful glow in his eyes. Even his spectacles no longer winked in the sun. Studying horse and rider, Ethan wasn't quite sure which supported the other. Mr. Stocking drew himself up straight and cleared his throat. The hand holding the rag drifted shakily about his vest as if to tidy it. The two horsemen traded a long level glance that seemed to hold a world of unspoken dialogue. That was a long three seconds you gave us, son, Mr. Stocking finally said. Have your ride. Ethan and I will walk Fizzy out for you. Daniel gently took the reins from Mr. Stocking's hand and turned them over to Ethan. Shall I give you a leg up? Daniel's voice was calm, without a hint of the sarcasm that Ethan would normally have expected. The little man blinked. He looked first at his own horse, then at Ivy, before his eyes locked again on Daniel's. He started to shake his head, but Daniel pressed Ivy's lead rope into the peddler's hand. We'll mind him fine for you. Daniel touched the gelding's sod and hide as if it were silk. You were right, sir, he said. That horse can run. Ethan gaped, mystified. Anyone could see that Fizzy was dead tired. Ivy was breathing hard too, but she pricked her ears forward and pawed the ground as if she were ready to go another round and then some. Mr. Stocking finally accepted Ivy's rope. The dullness behind his spectacles began to glow again. Yes, I was right, and not just about the horse. Something solemn and unspoken passed between the riders over Ethan's head. After Mr. Stocking had trotted Ivy away, Daniel's hands began to work over Fizzy. He murmured the magic words that Ethan thought belonged only to Ivy. Ethan's inside squirmed. Daniel hadn't even winced over relinquishing the mare, and now he was using Ivy's words on another horse. The betrayal was complete. 
You, you let him win, Ethan spluttered. Daniel didn't answer, but Ethan read confirmation in the other boy's eyes. Daniel shrugged apathetically, as if the race hadn't mattered to him after all. Why, Ethan demanded. Daniel led the gelding forward into a shuffling walk. Fizzy rested his nose heavily on the boy's shoulder, as if he needed help carrying his own head. Daniel's gray-green eyes narrowed at Ethan, the way the schoolmasters did when Ethan lost the way of figuring a simple sum. He said this horse would die for him. I'm not needing to see it proved. Thank you. Karen Warbeck Williams is the author of My Enemy's Tears, The Witch of Northampton, which won first place for general fiction at the 2012 New England Book Festival and The House on 7th Street to be published at a future date. In the late 70s, while living in Massachusetts and restoring a house built in 1710, she remembered the story her grandmother told her about her ancestor, Mary Bliss Parsons of Northampton, Massachusetts, who was accused of witchcraft in 1675. Mary Parsons died in 1712, just two years after the house they were restoring was built. Northampton was less than a two and a half hour drive. That revelation brought Williams to begin the research that led to the writing of this novel. Karen V. Williams. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. And uh, this is fun seeing so many people out wanting to hear um, us read. Um, I have to say, I did the research for, uh, the beginning research for this book right here at the Forbes Library. I came up and got a room in the, at the hotel and um, spent many days here looking at old maps and um, whatever I could find, um, taking all my notes and with pencil and paper. This was way before the internet. Um, so Mary Bliss Parsons, who, who uh, along with her husband and many settlers from uh, south down toward Springfield and Hartford, um, settled Northampton. And um, she did run into some big trouble here, um, but she brought it with her. Um, she had enemies that followed her here, and enemies especially. And uh, uh, so anyway, I wanted to read to you a little bit about um, from a section early on in the book when she's about 13 years old and a very difficult child that uh, her, her mother and father have decided she uh, can't live at home anymore. She has to go into service um, because she's too difficult and uh, needs some harsh realities in her life. With more than her usual anticipation, Mary set off to visit Goody Crispay. Ever since the day they met in the woods, Goody had been a secret friend. On the road to South Meadow, she passed the Podunk summer camp, some 30 wigwams in the meadow, where Indian women had planted corn and were busy tending their fields. In passing, Mary nervously looked their way. Then remembering what Goodwife Bartlett had said, she smiled and waved as if they were village women. The squaws seemed pleased and waved back, giving Mary even more new thoughts to ponder about Indians. She turned off the road onto the footpath, winding up the hill above the great river. Sweating from the heat of the day, she was glad for the shade of her hat's wide brim. As she approached Goody's little white house, the sight of her roof, now green with fresh grass shoots and spotted with yellow wildflowers, made her smile. No one else had a house like that anymore, built under a ledge with a grassy hill as a roof over her one room. Glancing down the path, Mary stopped dead in her tracks at the sight of a snake sleeping in the warmth of the sun. It wasn't the biggest snake she'd ever seen, but it had a diamond pattern running the full length of its back. It looked like a rattler, though she wasn't sure because every time her father had killed one, she'd run away without taking time to study it. She stood still, debating how she should pass. On one side was a barrier of steep rocks, while the other side fell off to the river below. Doing her best to keep calm, 
she decided to inch her way past on the river side of the path. But as she drew near, the snake reared its head, hissed, and lurched at her, bringing forth an ear-splitting scream. Goody Crispe must have heard Mary cry from inside her house, for she appeared at the window. Mary went on shrieking at the top of her lungs for Goody to come, while the snake recoiled and puffed itself up. Then, all of a sudden, it shivered, fell to the ground, rolled belly up, and lay perfectly still. Lord, have mercy, Mary cried as Goody reached her side, having run from the house as fast as her, as her short old legs could carry her. I've killed him. Why, that's Gawain, Ruby, Go Goody said. I haven't seen him all summer. She took hold of him just below his head and lifted him, stroking his long body gently with her little <coughs> herb-stained fingers. Mary shuddered. How can you touch that vile thing? He's not dead, Mary, Goody laughed, and gently laid him down in the sun-warmed rock. You've frighted him, and when he's afeard, he feigns death in the hope that thou wilt will go away and leave him alone. That's all he's wishing now, lying there still on the rock. Still, we take leave. Shall we take leave of the poor fellow? She reached to take Mary by the hand. Mary pulled back, thinking that the same hand that had held the snake she did not wish, wish to touch. He must not be a rattler, is he? Nay, he be a hognose snake. Harmless he is, safe to a toad. He's been around here many a year. A rattler would shake his tail. What name did you call him, Mary asked. Goody smiled. Gawain, I named him for a fearless knight, hoping a brave name would give him courage. After the heat of the sun, Mary was glad for the shadowy coolness of Goody's little house. Sit thee down, Mary. After such a fright, I'll brew some calming tea. Tell me, why hast thou come? Mary obeyed her friend and took a seat near the open windows. Unlike windows in any other house in the village, they were set wide, giving a wide view of the river flowing far below. Enchanted by the curious room, she sat quietly, taking everything in. Like every house in the village, its floor was strewn with bits of wormwood and herbs to sweeten the air, and in the dim light of the rafters hung branches of drying herbs. And there, the resemblance, resemblance to other houses ended. Three speckled eggs lay on the nest, on a nest in, on a table strewn with objects which must have been picked up on Goody's walks, weathered sticks, a collection of wild bird feathers, several seashells, the foot of a rabbit, and a strange necklace made of rawhide and bear claws, like Mary had seen squaws wear. A small carved crucifix of great age hung on one wall near an ancient mirror with a long crack running through the middle. These last two things, Goody had told her, came from her husband's family, who were French and Catholic. On another wall, a gaily painted charger hung over a two-drawer chest painted black. On the chest rested an oaken coffer with a lock, and next to it a Bible. A blanket chest sat to the right of the fireplace below a tinderbox, and a small shelf full of books. Across the room, in the shadows, stood the bedstead, under a blood-red coverlet. Mary was so taken by the room and the questions it evoked, that for a moment she forgot why she had come. Expecting to see Goody's pet crow, she looked up into the rafters. She'd seen him the first time he had vanished. His name was Uther, and he'd been with the old woman ever since his mother was shot in a cornfield. Where's Uther? Ah, he's out taken in the air, Goody said. He won't be long. Now tell me, why hast thou come? Just then, a whoosh of black wings. Uh, uh, in a whoosh of black wings, Uther flew in through the open window, cawing and calling, hello, he landed in the middle of the table, disturbing the still life of bird's eggs, twigs, and feathers. Delighted, Mary held out her hand to him, wondering about his timing. Strange things happened when Goody was near. However did you teach him to talk? He's a good listener and learned on his own. What words, what words can he say? Can I teach him to say my name? She asked as, she asked as Uther stepped uh, onto her hand. Try, if it pleases thee, Goody said with a smile. <coughs> Mary, say Mary, she coaxed, as Uther cocked his head and stared at her like she was daft. Ah, oh, Uther, can't you say Mary, Mary, she begged as the bird turned his head and flew up to the rafters. 
Though disappointed, Mary quickly lost interest, for she remembered what brought her here in the first place. Her eyes filling with tears, she brushed them away to confess. Mother and father say I must go into service. Where, Mary? At the Lyman's. Do you know Richard Lyman? Only by sight. And his sons and his daughter Sarah. I have seen them at meeting, but never been called to their house. Mary wondered if she'd, been this, if she'd seen the slightest shadow of concern pass over Goody's face. Mother says I need training by an impartial master, for I am spoiled and willful. She thinks she and father have loved me too much. For a moment, Goody was silent. Thou hast many fine virtues, Mary. Ah, Goody Crispe, you are deceived. I am the most selfish, willful, spoiled, and wicked maiden in the world. Goody laughed. Mary, I'm not deceived. Thou art none of those things. Why, what is known as willfulness in time may become thy greatest strength. It is true. Thou art, art still young and must learn how to use thy will for good. And it is possible that the Lymans may be the one to teach thee. But accept this new turn of events as a blessing, child. For surely your parents love thee so well and know best. Um, I think I have time to read another little uh, scene. Um, this is later when, um, let's see, Mary's probably 18, 17 now, uh, and uh, living in uh, Springfield. After the rigors of winter, the loons came back to the marsh, their eerie, demented laughter and accompaniment to the song of marsh wrens, the drumming of grouse, grouse, the trickle of water seeping everywhere as the snow melted. Flocks of wild turkeys sunned themselves on a bank below a blazing grove of red twig dogwood and at the feet of pussy willows. The spring brought sun and moderate, and, and moderate rains, and with them hope. By June, the fields and the kitchen garden were filled with tender young seedlings, the miracle Mary loved most. From tiny little seed to great cornstalk grow, she sang at planting time. After the planting, she waited, running to the field and garden every day for signs of first leaves pushing through the soil. Then she felt blessed and rewarded. Mary walked carefully across rows of lush young corn, lifting her skirts to keep from bruising them, heading for the edge of the woods to gather hellebore root for Hannah's toothache. As she entered the path through the brush, a, thrush a thrush's sudden brilliant song took her breath away. Clear it was and sweet, like a bell ringing high in the canopy. Such a merry sound charmed her. She looked up, hoping to see it, only to encounter a giant spider's web suspended by thin silken threads, threads hanging close over her head. She arched her back, shading her eyes for a better look at the web, a precision miracle glinting in the sunlight, now bowed and strained by a sudden breeze. Then she saw them, thousands of caterpillars, covering every inch of the massive trunk of a beech tree, she looked overhead at pine branches, and they too were covered. And then at the chestnut grove and leafless shrubs, both low and high, smothered with millions of sleeping caterpillars. Nearly every bit of green had disappeared from the woods. Was it only yesterday, she thought, that I looked with fondness at the green, newly green forest? Surely such devastation has taken more than one night. And now, with their gluttonous stomachs full, the caterpillars slept. There were so many, and the destruction they had wrought was so complete, they had left themselves no place to hide. Mary looked down at the forest floor to see that she was standing on caterpillars. She screamed, and her mouth filled with bile. Dizzy, she ran toward home, calling for her mother, trampling her father's cornfield. Everywhere throughout the plantation, folks talked of nothing but caterpillars. No one had seen a worse, worse infested, infestation. The people knew no line of defense, nor did they know what course the pestilence might take. Soon sated, the horrid worms began to drop from the trees until it seemed to rain caterpillars. Folks untangled the detestable creatures from their hair or scraped them off their shoulders. One could not step out the door or walk on the road without crushing the monstrous things underfoot. At night, villagers lay in their beds, unable to sleep for the noisome sound of caterpillars chewing the meadow grass, the fields of barley, corn, and wheat. The good wives wept at the loss of their kitchen gardens. Every man alive felt helpless and utterly hated by God. On the Sabbath, Mr. Hooker wept in his pulpit. 
Oh, how a soaking shower of righteousness would settle our shaking times, repair our losses, and store, restore the years with which the caterpillars, the sword, and the mildew have taken from us. After meeting, Goodwife Knapp said to her husband, with, with the devil's help, she'll ruin us all. I, tis the witch's work, Goodwife Olmstead said to her neighbor. Why, I saw her on the meadow with her walking stick, herding caterpillars she was, Goodwife Bunce told the fishmonger. And before my eyes, she raised her staff and spoke to the evil hoarders, whereupon they turned from their path towards Searle's cornfield. An hour later, he hadn't a seedling to his name. On his way out the door, Goodman good Bunce said to Deacon Mygat, Long have I known that the devil keeps her company. The deacon nodded, eager to add his bit. When I went to fix her roof, I seen a broken mirror and a cross on her wall. Did you know she keeps a black crow? She has knowledge of palms, you know. I saw her fly on a broomstaff high over the road and across the little river. The town quickly stirred to frenzy, and the magistrates brought Goody Crispe to trial. The hearing lasted the hearing lasted less than, mo than a morning, with testimony about a tragic walking stick, a forbidden idol, a familiar spirit in the form of a crow, and Goody Crispe's preternatural ability to fly. After the evidence was collected, the magistrates gave Goody a chance to confess. I want to be sure that I don't forget to mention that there's a, a wonderful table full of books um, by the writers who are reading tonight over there, and um, folks will be selling them and I think signing, right, after if you're interested, and um, Karen has offered to, to give copies of her book, um, so if you're interested, talk to her after the reading. Um, oh, and before I introduce Mary Ann, um, I also occurred to me to say that um, the library has a contingent at the, four, the Pride March um, this Saturday. At, um, we're meeting at 11.45 across from the brewery, and I'll be there. And if anybody wants to join us in that, um, we'd love to have you. So, Mary Ann Banks says that there are two things she knew about herself as a kid in a small town in western Massachusetts that she was a lesbian, though that was a word that no one used, and that she wanted to be a writer. Growing Up Delicious, Marianne's first novel, took 25 to 30 years to write, with time off for bad behavior, coming out of the closet, and self-doubt. Her second novel, Keepsake Self-Storage, hasn't taken as long. Marianne says that when she was growing up, there were few stories for girls like her, about girls like her, and that she wanted to write some. I'm glad that she has, and I know you will be too. Marianne. Make the family happy. Ina looked back out the window. Now that was one unhappy home, Ina said aloud, surprised she'd spoken. How many nights had that Jenny run over here like she was being chased by bees? Can Mavis play? Can Mavis play? Once she even came over when she knew Mavis was at Girl Scout camp and asked if there wasn't something she could help Ina with around the house. They made Toll House cookies and watched the Brady Bunch. Ina decided she would go across the street and say hello. Maybe invite her to dinner. Even if Jenny was one of those lesbians now, she looked pretty much like she always had. <laughs> the years had been kind to Mrs. Lukowski. Her hair was grayer and the laugh lines had deepened, but otherwise she looked pretty much the same. How have you been, Mrs. Lukowski? Aside from a little diverticulitis, I've been fine. She wiped her plump hands on an apron appliqued with number one grandma. I was so sorry to hear about Gertrude's passing. She paused to cross herself. Never in a million years would I have imagined her, well, taking her own life. Yes, I know, it took us all by surprise, I said, thinking that had to be the understatement of the year. <laughs> surprise isn't the word. Why, Earl and I were having breakfast Saturday morning and he noticed your sister pull into the driveway. Not that that was unusual. I often said to Earl how I wished our girls lived close enough to stop by more often. 
You know, Mavis lives down in Connecticut, and Roxy and her family are all the way out in Eugene, Oregon. Anyway, it wasn't long before we noticed Dorothy running up to the barn, which was unusual. Not two minutes later, she came running out of that barn like she'd seen a ghost. Oh, pardon me, I didn't mean that, dear. That's okay. Now that was an unsettling thought, Gert, the unfriendly ghost. <laughs> of course, Earl and I wondered what was going on. We were just having our second cup of coffee and thinking about going to see what was wrong when we heard sirens. I got a bad feeling then. I just knew something had happened to Gertrude. It was strange to hear my mother referred to by her entire name. She hated the name Gertrude. Almost everyone called her Gert. Mavis and I nicknamed her Gert the Alert. <laughs> Mrs. Lukowski and my mother didn't exactly get along. Why do you have to play with that Mavis, my mother would ask every once in a while. Because she's my friend, I would say, trying to sidle out the door before I had to hear what I knew was coming next. She's Catholic. You know that, don't you? Yes, Mom. You realize she's on a fast train to hell. Yes, Mom. <laughs> Papists are no better than those Canaanites dancing around the golden calf. Yes, Mom. What would they're praying to all those saints and kowtowing to the Pope? They're nothing short of pagans. Yes, Mom. Can I go out and play now? <laughs> Just so long as you remember where you come from, young lady. I'd never been able to forget. Where I came from followed me like a very long shadow. I suddenly realized Mrs. Lukowski's lips were moving, and I had no idea what she was saying. Covered with a sheet, just like one of those crime shows on television. It was difficult to reconcile the Courier and Ives picture of where I came from to include this latest image. <laughs> Dorothy was not looking forward to seeing her sister. She felt bad about that. She really did. She wanted to love Jennifer. But all she felt for her was shame and embarrassment. Dorothy knew that wasn't right. Pastor Jameson had preached countless times on loving thy neighbor as thyself. She felt pretty sure that thy neighbor also meant thy sister. Everyone knew God was all about love. Dorothy knew God thought she should love everyone, even sinners or people who weren't necessarily bad but weren't Christians either. Jennifer fell into that category. First and foremost, there was the gay thing. Dorothy couldn't bear to use the word lesbian. It sounded so ugly. At least gay had a happy, harmless sound to it. <laughs> Though it wasn't harmless, it was an abomination to the Lord. It was hard having a sister everyone, including God, didn't approve of. Love the sinner, hate the sin, Pastor Jameson was always saying. Jimmy said that was because his daughter had straightened up and flew right. What a scandal that had been. Dorothy shuddered when she thought about Jennifer and the pastor's daughter, Ruth, having a, what was the word, affair. Not that anyone ever said anything, but everyone knew it, all because of how Jennifer had behaved at Ruth's wedding. Oh, it was sickening. Pastor Jameson had been a saint, even after Jennifer had tried to kill him. He'd refused to press charges and forgave her publicly from the pulpit, saying Jennifer was possessed by Satan and wasn't really responsible for what she was doing. <laughs> Dorothy wasn't sure she bought that explanation. She figured it had much more to do with Jennifer drinking too much beer, coupled with the fact that Ruth was getting married. In any case, Jennifer wasn't charged and came skulking home after they let her out of jail. Dorothy thought their mother was going to have a stroke. She yelled and waved around the huge King James family Bible with such a vengeance that she ended up tearing a ligament in her shoulder and needed a sling for six weeks. <laughs> Mother was such a righteous woman. That's why it was so hard to understand why she had done what she'd done. Dorothy always knew Mother would pass away before her. That was the way of the world, but not like this. Tears stung Dorothy's eyes. No, she would not give in. It was important that Jennifer see her like she usually was a together person with her own daycare business and a happy marriage. Dorothy squinted into the rearview mirror. It was really amazing how normal she looked, considering that her whole life was going to you know where in a handbag. <laughs> Thank you.
Suzanne strimpik Shea is the author of five novels and four works of nonfiction, the most recent being 140 Years of Providential Care, The Sisters of Providence of Holyoke, Massachusetts, with her husband, Tom Shea, and M.P. Barker. She is completing her fifth nonfiction book, This is Paradise, about a clinic in the African country of Malawi. Winner of 2000, the 2000 New England Book Award, which recognizes a literary body of works contribution to the region. Suzanne began writing books in her spare time while working as a reporter for the Springfield newspapers and the Providence Rhode Island Journal. She's a member of the faculty at the University of Southern Maine Stone Coast MFA program in creative writing and is a writer in residence and director of the writing programs at Bay Path College in Longmeadow, Massachusetts. She lives in Bond, Bondsville, Massachusetts. Suzanne is a beloved writer and such a gift to have in our community and at the reading tonight. so much, Susan. Thank you for having me here. And to Michelle and Karen and Marianne. This is an honor to be included. And look at all of you. Thank you so much for being here. I always like to begin a reading by thanking people who listen, because if nobody listened or read, we wouldn't be in business. So very grateful. I also want to say, as I'm sitting here and enjoying the readings, my, I'm focusing on this chair. We should all work so hard, I think, especially the writers among us, that when they have our museum, our chair is worn out on the seat. So you have to check this out later as inspiration. So I'm going to read uh, from a novel that I've finished called Make a Wish But Not for Money, which is what a palm reader in New York said to me once after I gave her 10 bucks. Um, I was in New York and, and I saw a sign, it said palm readings, $10. And I said, well, what can you get in New York for 10 bucks? That's legal. So I um, went inside and she took my hand and said, make a wish but not for money. And I, it, I don't remember anything else she said except I said, I've got to write something with that as a title. So that turned into a novel about a woman. Uh, and I'm kind of on the, on, the, on the local history side of this tonight as well because this is set in a certain dead mall that some of us might remember. <laughs> <laughs> to find the place of all knowledge, just get a here. To find the place of all knowledge, First find the flaming pit. Enter the mall at that sign. Take a left past the wide oaken doors of the brick-faced restaurant with its faint, faint steaky smell in its three sunken dining rooms, each lower than the previous and staggered around a massive propane-powered open fireplace. Walk past the adjacent pit pub door lit by a pair, lit by a pair of medievalish mace and chain lanterns burning, burning with orangey light bulbs haywired to mimic flickering wicks. Then past the fluorescent tube brightness of fast photo in its lab-coated cashier flipping through a magazine for hairstyles, the nearby developing machine rolling its gears in vain, depositing no sets of four by six images onto the tray that has been angled toward the window for the interest of the absent passerby. After that, past the first dark store window and the second dark store window and the third and fourth consecutive ones, as well as the matching empty ones on the opposite side of the corridor. Unless you are thirsty for a frosty cup of the namesake specialty or are craving a dog with the works, don't stop at the Orange Julius stand jutting from the middle of the stone-dead mall hallway like an island of 70s kitsch, its only inhabitant a tired and thin and pale middle-aged woman in a peaked paper hat, orange and brown polyester pantsuit who gazes up at you with surprise, then fast shifts her eyes downward to the Frankfurters tumbling on the endlessly rotating grill. Move along the next inter uninterrupted stretch of darkened windows, three or four of them papered with a stretch of yellowing, rainbow-colored letters inviting you to feel the excitement. <laughs> Notice that without realizing it, you have begun to walk to the beat of the instrumental version of Do You Know the Way to San Jose? <laughs> Echoing from the scratching ceiling speakers. Keep going until you come to the wishing well that doesn't turn the water that's not beneath it. Note the cheery 
sheet metal signs that direct you to Maine and Spring and Pleasant, which are not really streets but the mall's three arm-like halls of shops that are split at the town common where the trio converge and where a gazebo, dry cement pond, flagless pole, and much square yardage of once emerald astroturf have been arranged to mimic the center of an old New England village. <laughs> this bucolic theme has been inserted anywhere space allowed, around the common where your footsteps take on an increased echo, the mall grows a second story, despite there actually being no shops reaching that high. The walls rise simply to allow the visual effects of false building fronts above the lo stores lining the common. Shutter-edged windows have been painted with silhouettes, a woman reading a book, a girl holding a doll, a baker sniffing a loaf of bread from which wisps of aroma float. Suggestions of life in a place that now has little. Faded plastic ivy and grayed morning glories cascade from planters beneath each sill. One planting has an attracted and oversized fake monarch. Another includes a nest occupied by hope-bearing stuffed bluebirds. High above, the skylights allow real and genuine sunlight to cascade. Cinemas 1 and 2 are to your right, down Pleasant, but you should continue straight on Main. Though it might not appear so, the busiest section of the mall is ahead. This is Main Street, after all. Music Man is located here, just before his brother, the Tax Man. The Village Barber across from them, the Village Stylist next door. And two blank storefronts down, just after a small stand of plastic maples shading a concrete bench and an ashtray on a stand. And just past Experience Travel and Bunny's Card Nook, look for the one large shop shared by Lenses Moore, an affordable attorney. You have arrived. <laughs> to find the place of all knowledge, enter the next doorway. The one across from Mom and Sis's craft shop. Turn in at the sign for Irene, Queen of the Unseen. Her parlor sits at the end of that alley-shaped space. When the mall opened 40 years ago, this square footage was the proud home of the tie rack and the owner of that business thought it perfect to select a space shaped long and skinny, roughly the dimensions of the headache-inducing choices of neckwear that hung from scores of pegs nailed floor to ceiling. To Irene Cervelli, occupant of this space for the 18 years since the mall relocated her shop and those of the scattering remaining tenants into a central location, the length of the store creates drama a prolonging of your journey to reach her and the answers and insights you might seek. From the lip of the mall corridor, you must walk a good 16 paces, each one bringing you closer to the curtained half-circle window cut into the big black far wall. There is nothing between you and that window but the long stretch of gray industrial carpet beneath your sneakers. And finally, the purple upholstered high back chair in which you will sit to ring the bell that alerts Irene to your presence, though someone with her gift surely already knows you were there. <laughs> she indeed have to, had to know you would be there well before you were walking past the dried up wishing well, before you pushed open that door at the pit, before you parked your car, before you steered it off Boston Road and took your pick of the thousands of vacant car parking spaces before you even left your garage, before you had your decaf and your second Winston, before you opened your eyes and focused on the blank white wall across from your bed, then at the unpalatable lump stirring next to you, before you were reminded yet again that you were not where you wanted to be in your life, and you wondered for the millionth time just where you were supposed to be. The palm reader certainly knew all this about you, knew everything, because isn't this what these people do? Aren't they supposed to know all? You finish the walk to the far end of the space and you pull the cord marked ring bell. After a few silent seconds, the curtain parts, not in the middle like on a stage, but only from the right. A hand secures it to an unseen hook, and then most of the rest of this Irene woman appears as she rolls her chair to the center of the half circle cutout. She is not what you had anticipated, though what would you know about such things as this is your first time visiting a palm reader? What you know is from psychic people portrayed in movies and books, and from your cousin who long ago had her fortune told at a harvest fair up in Buckland. That palm reader who told your cousin she would bear two children, one a boy who would bring happiness, the other a girl who would carry misery. And because of that, after your cousin's first son, your cousin said her husband for a vasectomy. 
That palm reader wore a silver ring on a big toe that bore a tuft of hair and curled like a monkey's digit. You cannot see this Irene's toe, so you aren't able to check if this is a shared palm reader characteristic. You can see only everything from the waist up, that much of her looks like anyone else, like any other rather well-kept 50-ish white woman, a face that if you had to select it from a chart would be called oval. Dark eyes set low, resulting in a big, wide forehead, a span of flat flesh that draws your eyes right to it before anything else due to its acreage. But considering her work, maybe that is where all the thought cooking and fi figure future figuring happens. Her hair is done in a rather nice, short, choppy style, not unlike that of the news anchor who came to speak at your ladies' church club and told how she gets that nice, short, choppy style created for free at a fancy shop in Longmeadow that in return gets its name run at the end of the news program. But the anchor's hair was blonde, and this woman in front of you, her hair is black. And she's wearing a fuzzy green sweater with a minimum of jewelry, no rings, no earrings, no watch, only a thin golden chain looped around her neck and disappearing behind the green knit. So you won't know what, if anything, it bears, unless you ask, and you feel you would have to be acquainted to her, with her at least a tiny bit in order to do that. All in all, this palm reader, this woman Irene, looks no more or no less like somebody regular, somebody normal, somebody every day who might rush from work and take your seat next to you at your nephew's youth wind ensemble concert and start quickly flipping through the program to find the point to which the night already has progressed. Certainly, she does not look like anybody in a film, which is this, what this feels like to you, the actual coming here, the doing something like this, the thinking the scary things you were thinking about your life and your yet unknown future. It's all something that happens to actresses portraying troubled housewives on the Women's Entertainment Channel. This is not something that happens to the likes of you. Even simply the sitting down and the facing this Irene woman and having her face you and extend her palm, her hand palm up and ask $10 please, which you quickly find in the clear plastic purse in which you keep your coupons and grocery money and you place the five, two five dollar bills in her hand and she nods and smiles and tucks them to an unseen place to the right of the half circle cutout. And then she reaches out again, one hand then the other and she asks you to do the same. You hold yours out and you see they are shaking. Next door, the affordable attorney is sharpening her pencils with a whining electric gizmo her mother gave her for Christmas. Next door to her, the village barber blows a puff of air into the blades of his rusting beard trimmer. And next to him, the music man strums a plaintive G diminished and closes his eyes. Outside, the maintenance man is sidestepping along the walkway of the 30-foot-tall Orchard Mall sign. Sure, two inches of snow fell the night before, and another two or three are being forecast to begin around the supper hour. But on this same day, a new season has started. And thanks to his work, there it is, announced to the world in two-foot-tall letters. Spring. But you and your focus are here still, inside, inside the mall, at the far end of the store, space 63, where this Irene woman is taking both of your hands into the surprising warmth and comfort of her own. I'm just going to skip ahead for a fitting ending. Yes. The only question so far from this woman, I, Irene, is open your hand. She directs, you know, she says, though you didn't, this is the hand, the hand of inheritance, what you arrived here on earth carrying. She speaks slowly with some hesitation about it showing the talents, the inclinations, the powers that were your, yours at birth. Your right hand, she says a bit more loudly after clearing her throat. This one tells me that you will do or what you already have done with these things. And just with these bits of information for the first time in your life, you look down at your palms with real interest. On the left, there is an ink mark near the top of your wrist, a model childhood stove-touching scar at the edge of the thumb. They are all that stands out for you. They and the fact that your palm is beginning to look old, like this woman Irene's here. Hers, like yours, having opened and closed a zillion times. But on this day, this morning, with your hand and her hand, it becomes something quite different. 
The San Jose song is over and something else has started up. Not music this time, not any other song, but something more like an energy that fills your ears and the space around you. And you wonder, can this woman Irene hear it too as she peers closely into your skin and her eyes widen? As she spots something other than the ink and the scar and the faint crossroadish crease between your second and third fingers just above the well where you could hold your turnpike toll money or catch rain at the start of a long-awaited shower. There is Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, how do you know what funny is when you're laughing at yourself? <laughs> you know, when you're going along and all of a sudden you're just so tickled with what you just wrote. That's what I know. And then sometimes you think it's funny and, and, and you read it and no one says anything. Why are you afraid? Well, I, you know, I don't want it to stop, so I don't really think about it. I just let it happen, but I don't try to figure it out. It probably won't stop because it's probably the way you look at the world. Uh, you have a unique vision, and it happens to be funny. <laughs> Carolyn, did you have a question? Oh, okay. Any one of you or all of you talk a little bit about you know, finding your inspiration for the story? Did it come quickly? You had the snaps, or you were already moving into something that evolved into your book? It was like a gift, you know, just that. Hey, 
we are here. here. <laughs> Any more questions or responses? Yeah. Do you want to each tell us a little bit about how you got your first book published? Like what your path was? Mine was 
was easy. I self-published. Yeah, it was all because I didn't want to write a query letter. <laughs>
just a, a self publisher that did that. Um, it was expensive, and uh, um, so. And what was the other part of your question? The, well, did you need to sell a certain number of books? No. And how did this? Begin? What they do is print on demand. They don't even print the books until they're sold. But I think the question is the transition from self-publishing to getting an agent. How did that happen? Oh, well, um, my, my book has done well um, on Amazon. And also, uh, you know, I've gotten a lot of good reviews. So it has five stars on Amazon. And then it won a, uh, it's hardly the Booker Prize, but it won a... Uh, it's a big award. Uh, they won, I won an award of the best uh, fiction uh, for, for the New England Book Festival. And so I was approached immediately after giving my acceptance speech by a, an agent. And she said, have you ever thought about having an agent? And I said, no. And I gave the joke about not wanting to write a query letter. And, and mm -hmm. then I handed her my book and she read it and she contacted me after that, and we signed a contract for two years. Mm -hmm. So that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of little steps along the way. So you never had a regular? I never had a regular But when I do, I'm going to ask her to help. <laughs> Maybe it is for, I don't know how you guys did it, is to get little quotes from other writers or critics or whatever to put on your, to put on your book, you know, and so I, that was hard. So, are there more questions? My answer. If there are no other questions, I'll ask one more. Um, in your process of writing the, the story, um, story reveal itself as you were writing, or did you know ahead of time what was going to happen? No clue. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely no clue. Um, I was uh, in a writing group in which the person who ran the group would give an exercise, like write something that's about the color red, or you know, give you photos, you can pick a photo, and write about the photo. And whenever I got stuck, I would just stick these characters in to whatever the situation was, the exercise was. So I had maybe 20 or 30 random scenes, 30 pages of random scenes before I actually figured out that I had to have a plot. <laughs> um, and I still, it took me, for the, the first draft I had 700 pages, so there was a lot of material that I did not need um, as I was wandering around trying to find my plot and figure out what the heck I was doing. Um, so, so yeah, I, I had no clue um, where the story was going. And, and the, the second book that I had was out next year. I had a little bit more of a clue, but still, it took me a good 40 or 50 pages of writing to figure out where the plot was going and how to solve the problems with the characters. So, uh, not to do outline or plot or anything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you so much. For